to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit.
of who you are today. God, wherever we're at, whatever we're bringing into this room, remind us that that you're provided, that you're for us, that you're with us. 
God, you are good, you are holy, you are worthy of our praise. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping alongside of us. You can go ahead and have a seat. And now the portfolio, fully diversified. All right, Jim, you're shot. So uh, go ahead, keep your head down, keep your eye on the ball, and don't overswing it this time. <sighs> to be or not to be, that is the question. Houston, we have a problem here. I'm just glad we got the last card, really. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Now remember, it breaks left to right. It's left to right. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Bro, where are you going? We gotta finish the hole. I'll be back. If you say so. There's no place like home. What is wrong with you? Marriage. We all have those phrases or famous quotes that stick with us. Nobody puts baby in the corner. But they never actually help us in our everyday life. I'm the king of the world! What if we took the time to memorize some biblical truths that will actually be useful if we apply them in the right moments? Join us for Quotable, new series starting next week. Don't you want to go home, Ball? Are you too good for your home? How many of you at each campus knew all of those movies that those were from? Y'all need a life, all right? Uh, I knew all of them, so I need a life. Uh, welcome to Grace. We're glad that you're here. Next weekend, we're going to start that conversation about uh, verses that we should have memorized. Now, obviously here at Grace, we believe that all of the Bible is incredible and uh, impacts our lives and helps us understand God and know God and follow God. But there are these verses that like, if we could just get a hold of them, some verses that aren't even very long, we could know them, understand them, memorize them, and be able to quote them to ourselves, maybe to our families, to our friends, it would make a big difference. And so next weekend, we're gonna spend some time talking about some of those verses, and we're gonna do that for a handful of weekends, and I think it'll be a really valuable time. So I encourage you to be here and bring someone with you. But this weekend, we're gonna do something we don't do very often at Grace, but every so often we do it, which is we're just gonna have a stand standalone weekend where we're going to have a conversation about some things that are regarding just like our church, okay? So if you are a guest, if this is maybe your first or second time here, uh, this is like showing up at your friend's house and you ended up in their family meeting that they're going on in the living room. So maybe you had that happen where you were at a friend's house and you're like, why are you guys talking about this stuff in front of me? Uh, and this is maybe a little bit too much, but I don't, I don't think it's actually going to be maybe as intimidating or I don't think we're being insensitive. I actually think you're gonna get a picture at some of the heart of grace, what we love, what we value, what we care about and what we want to be about. And so uh, you're gonna have a chance to sit on this family meeting and really hear this exhortation and think, okay, how do I feel about that? And where do I stand with these things? Particularly if you're considering grace as your church. Now, if you're on the other side and this is your home, like I go to grace, someone stopped you and they saw you and they said, where do you go to church? And you said, I go to grace fellowship. Then I am talking to you, like directly to you. Like, please open your ears, please open your mind, please open your heart and say, this is my church. This relates to me and my involvement and ownership and commitment and what it means to be a part of Grace Fellowship. Because ultimately what we're talking about over the course of just this weekend and this conversation is this reality that as a church, this is what we wanna think about this weekend, we wanna continue in our calling. We wanna continue in our very specific calling to be Grace Fellowship. Look, 
We are part of the global church. We are part of the church universal in the world. And it is not our job to make up the mission. God gave us the mission to go into the world and to make disciples. And as we've been talking about that, we're to do that in all nations. So the mission has been determined and it is happening all over the world in lots of different places. But we are, what God uh, teaches us to do is gather in a local place as a local group of people and be a local church. And we are this specific group of believers here at Grace Fellowship. We are this group of people with these gifts at this place, at this time in history, with this, this leadership, with these philosophies. And we are to continue in what God has called us to do uniquely in the church universal as us as a church. And by God's grace, God's allowed us to do some pretty cool things to see some pretty amazing things, to be a part of some really incredible, significant things. And I know when some of you hear that, you think we just mean bigger and better in terms of growth. And there is a part of that that is true, but it also means that people have grown in their soul and are more mature. Like, listen, the Bible is very clear. God wants more and better disciples, not just more disciples or better disciples, but both, but both. And we are committed to that unapologetically that we would continue to be who God has called us to be. Not to be some other church, not to do what they're doing, not to be exactly like them, but to be like us. That I would be the lead pastor God wants me to be, that you would be the person you're supposed to be here, that we would serve and reach exactly who we're supposed to serve and reach. And again, it's been an incredible thing to see what God has done. In fact, some of you may think that this conversation is happening because things may be bad or there's like something to tell you that's not good. But here's what I'll tell you. Virtually every single thing at Grace Fellowship is up and to the right. There are more people ever in groups. There are more students at all of our campuses that are involved in ministry. There are more young adults that are involved in everything in our church. We're going to take in more money than we've ever taken in. We're going to give more money than we've ever given. We're baptizing 200 plus people. Like everything's good. This isn't like, oh my gosh, we have a family meeting because we have a crisis. This is like, no, let's keep talking about what we've been doing, what we are doing, and what we need to be doing. Let's keep talking about how we continue to move forward. As I was thinking about this and preparing for this, I found uh, basically my three main bullet points of my notes from the first time I ever preached on this stage. The first time I ever was in this room on this stage giving a sermon to people, the three main things that I talked about where that if we're gonna be a church that has the type of trajectory and future that we wanna have, we're gonna to have to leverage our lives for the fame of God, we're gonna to have to take sin seriously, and we're gonna to have to prioritize people far from God. We're gonna to have to take who we are and leverage it to make God famous. We're gonna to have to take sin seriously and let God change us, and we are going to have to be people who say people far from God need to know Jesus. What I can tell you is since that conversation, by God's grace, we've been able to do that. That many of us, hundreds of us, thousands of us have been a part of allowing that to go on. But as we come to where we are, the question is not, because it's great, it's great to know what God has done. But I always get nervous when personally or in our church, we start to talk more about who we used to be than who we're supposed to be. When we start to think more about the pictures that are in the album than the pictures we could take and add to what God's gonna do in the future. And so what do we think and what do we want as we move forward? So here's what I do, want to do before I go any further, okay? If you go to Grace, this is your home, this is your church, whatever campus that you're at this weekend, what I just want you to do right now is I wanna pray for us. And I just want you to open your hands. To just open your hands if this is your church. And I want to pray for us, and I want you to posture your body, if you're comfortable, just to say, God, I know I need to hear this. I know I need to receive this. I need to see what's going on in my heart. So God, Father God, we thank you for the people that have gone before us to make grace grace, the people that have allowed us to be who we are today for the many, many things that you have done. And we open our hands in a posture that says, God, we want to receive, we want to learn, we want to be humble, we want to go forward, we want to be convicted where we need to be convicted, we want to change where we need to change, we want to keep doing what we need to keep doing, we want to celebrate what we should celebrate, and we want to prune what we should prune. And we want to do all of this for your fame and your glory. So teach us, open our hearts and our minds, and we pray this in the name of Jesus, and together we said, amen. 
So just this week, I got back from uh, a golf trip. And it's a golf trip that I've gone on now for a handful of years. Uh, this year, there were 20 of us. Most of them go to Grace or have some connection to Grace. And we go up to Northern Michigan and we spend a few days and we play golf. And we play a lot of golf. To be honest, we play too much golf, which I never thought I could say. But my body's telling me it's too much golf. Like 118 holes in four days kind of golf. Like a lot of golf. Like my back's not built to do that kind of golf. Uh, and so we play a lot of golf and it's fun. And as guys go out, you know, you go out in a foursome and then everyone starts to finish their rounds. And as guys finish their rounds, they start to come in and you do what golfers do. You start to talk about how you played, right? How did the round go? So you start to hear, you know, what'd you shoot? What'd you shoot? What'd you, how'd you play? And then the next group comes in and everybody starts talking. And then eventually what begins to happen slowly is people start to talk about various shots they hit on various holes. So do you guys remember that par three? You remember seven? You remember how it has an elevated green? And I was in between clubs and I had to make a decision. And I made a decision because I was really going to go for it. And so I hit and I was short. You guys remember that par five? I thought I could get there in two. And so I had to decide, do I want to try to hit over the water? Do I not want to hit over the water? Do I want to go for it? Do I want to play it safe? What do I want to do? And then guys start talking about what they do. Yeah, I remember I was right by the green on three and I had a bad chip and then I missed the putt. And I took a double bogey. And, was, and guys start talking about how the hole went, how the shot went. But what I've recognized is that every one of those shots begins with what happens right here. That every person before they hit the shot, they walk over to their bag and based on the yardage that they have and the feel of what's going on, they look through what you can have in a golf bag is up to 14 clubs and they make a decision. And they make a decision what to pull. What club am I gonna hit? And here's what you need to understand. This decision is going to impact what's about to happen. Whether you're going to be long or you're going to be short or whether you're going to hit it fat or you're going to hit it thin, yep, it is impacted by your swing, of course. But it begins with this decision. And there's a lot of things that go into what club I decide to pull from that bag. But what is about to happen begins with the decision that I'm about to make from here. And that decision in that moment shapes what happens normally in the next 20 to 30 seconds. And then it shapes what happens for the rest of the round. And then it shapes the story you tell when you're sitting around eating a brat, drinking a Gatorade. And whether that story is a good story, a bad story, a funny story, or a sad story. And it's emblematic of something that is true in all of life. And as soon as I say this to you, you're going to know that this is way bigger than the game of golf. It's the way that life works. It's the reality of the way decision-making works. It's the power of a now. And here's what it is. Today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. Today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. The moment you decide to pull that certain club, it begins to impact what story you're going to be able to tell the rest of the group or you're going to be able to tell the rest of the trip. And this works this way, not only on a golf course, but this works whether or not you decided to go skydiving or not, whether you decided to ride that roller coaster or not, whether you decided to walk across that room and ask out that girl or that guy. Today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. This is true of your personal finances. This is true of your physical health. This is true of the way you raise your kids. This is true of your business, that today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. And ladies and gentlemen, this is also true in a church, that today's decisions become what we're able to tell potentially tomorrow or not. Now listen to me. I am under no delusions that me or us control all that happens in a church. Under no delusions. Nothing happens outside of the hand and grace of God Almighty. But the Bible says in Proverbs 21, 31, prepare the horse for battle and victory belongs to the Lord. We do not control the victory, but we do control whether or not we prepare. And our decisions today will impact the stories we tell in the future, just like the stories we're able to tell right now are based on the decisions that we made back then. What clubs did we pull 10 years ago that allowed us and allowed by God's grace to be the church we are today? And what is it that we should pull going forward? 
What is it that we should look at and say, hey, what do we want to be so we understand what decisions to make in this moment? So the question is, if today's decisions are going to become tomorrow's stories, I think there's a question we should all ask that's a question, again, in our personal life, in our family life, in our health, in our money. It's this question right here. That we should come to a place where we all say, well, what directs you to decide what to do? What actually defines and directs your decisions? You know, on the golf course, that's a lot of things. It's wind, it's yardage, it's how you're hitting the ball, it's the course. Sometimes it's determined by your values. Are you an aggressive player? Are you a conservative player? Are you a competitive player? What did the person you're playing with do? Are you trying to compare yourself to them? If they got it there and could hit it that far, do you think you can hit it that far? Sometimes you're determined by what you did in the past is what you're gonna decide in that moment. I've played this course before and I know a five iron is the way to go or I know a five iron isn't. All those things come into play and the same is true with your kids, with your money, with your life. All of that is true. So here's a question, Grace. What should direct us to decide what we should do as a church? How do we decide? Another campus, not another campus. Build, don't build. Get rid of campuses, keep campuses. How, how do we decide those things? How do, how do we decide what steps we should take? How do we decide where we should go? What goes into the filter to say, hey, if today's decisions become tomorrow's stories, well, what, decision, what drives us to make the decisions that we're gonna make? I think all of us recognize at a church like Grace and at any church, but certainly in a church like us, there's a complicated reality that a bunch of things go into it. There's a bunch of things that drive and help us decide what we should do. You know, one of the clubs that would be in our bag at Grace is we would come over here and we would say, we're gonna be driven by the club of truth. We should never do anything outside of what the scripture would tell us not to do. That our values, that our future should be decided by what the Bible says. That we can't teach and go after things. And we've always been committed to the Bible. And we should always be committed to the Bible. And if we start to do anything that doesn't allow us to swing this club ugly, then we have a problem. We should always, as a church, probably be committed to the club of equipping one another. That the Bible says we should be built up to unity, to maturity, that we should always want people to grow and move forward and we should train and develop and we should do whatever it takes to equip and we should be committed to that. But not just truth and not just equipping, we should, we should probably be committed to the club of grace and we should probably be committed to the club of kindness and we should probably be committed to the, the club of, of, of reaching people with evangelism. We should probably be committed to all those things. And yet there's one particular club that I want us to think about this weekend. That the Bible says if this club, listen to me, if this club is not in your bag, you cannot please God. That's not hyperbole. That's not exaggeration. That's not manipulation. It's what the Bible says. It says, if this club is not a part of who we are, we as a group of individuals and as a body cannot please the Lord. If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn on or turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we need to ask ourselves, and I think historically this club has been in our bag, and I think at times we've swung it really well. But I think we have an opportunity to really consider how do we make sure we're continuing to leverage it? How do we leverage it on a grand scale, but how do we leverage it on an individual scale to really become and continue to be the kind of church that God would want us to be? Now, if you're familiar with Hebrews 11, you should know it already because you know what this chapter is really known as and what it represents. And it begins right away in Hebrews chapter 11 as the author says this as he begins, now faith. Faith. Faith, faith is a, a term that we use in our culture in a lot of different ways. Faith is a term that defines generic religion. So Islam is a faith and Buddhism is a faith and Shintoism is a faith and Christianity is a faith. But he's not talking about that. 
He's talking about your belief that becomes a filter for your decision making on how you live your life. And he says this about faith. He says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's what we want. But it's also assurance about what we do not see. Faith is this club that we swing, listen to me, that allows us to live as though everything God says is true is actually true. Faith is the club that allows us to live as though everything God says is true is actually true and we make our decisions by faith. When we think about what we're going to do with our life, as we think about what we're going to do with our church, we think about how today's decisions will become tomorrow's stories. One of the filters for our decisions, one of the clubs we should swing is we need to ask, do we have faith? Faith is this component that requires you to trust that me as a leader or us as elders or you and all of us as a church can't always figure everything out, don't always understand every angle, can't solve every problem, that while we will prepare and strategize and look to do the right thing, we say, God, we're going to believe the things you say are true and we're going to go after those. It's a, it's a confidence in what we want to be true, but it's also an assurance in what we do not see. And if you know this chapter, it's all about these people who lived out faith. And the text says this. It says, this faith is what the ancients were commended for. All of these people that are in this chapter... What God said, good job, I'm proud of you for, thank you, well done. What he said was, you grabbed the club of faith and you swung it. You're celebrated for it. You are commended for it. Let me, let me just ask you a question before I go any further. How big is your faith? Not, not do you have a faith in Jesus and believe that Jesus is the son of God and God, like, like that you have a faith, you are a Christian. Yep, yep, yep. But how big is your faith in that? I'm, I'm, I try to be, again, so consistent with telling you guys the good and the bad that is me and the failures and the weaknesses and the strengths. And there's a lot of things by God's grace I, I feel blessed to be able to do and think that are strengths. But I can tell you this, if there was one particular thing that I could like you know, like a video game sort of add to who I am as a person and as a Christian, it's I wish I had more faith. And I can explain all the reasons sometimes that I don't always live by big faith. I live by the truth and I know the Lord, but I, but I, but I don't always have the kind of faith <laughs> that would say, hey, it's not rain and build a boat because the world's gonna flood. I, I don't have always the kind of faith that says, go talk to the most powerful person in the world and tell him to let your people go and trust that you'll be okay and he'll set them free. I don't think I have the kind of faith that if God told me that I was supposed to leave my home and go to a place he would tell me later and leave my family because I'm gonna bless you like the stars in the sky that I would just pick up, get the U-Haul and go. And yet, today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. And in the middle of that is not just our generic, we believe Jesus saves us from hell. It's a daily wake up and go, everything that this book says is true. Everything that it promises is real. Everything that it says I am, I am. Everything it says I should value, I should. Everything it says I should die to, I should. I will wake up and say, I will live as though that is real. And he says, when you do that, you are commended. Whoo. Imagine a group of people in a church that live like that. That's a force. And today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. 
He begins to unpack this a little bit in the scripture and down in verse six, the author of Hebrews goes and says this, and without faith, it's impossible. Whatever's gonna follow next is probably not good if it's impossible. And he says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Those who chase him and pursue him and want more of him and more of his mission and more of his bride, which is the people of God, and want more people to know him and want to grow themselves, want their affection stirred for him. God looks and he says, I will reward those people who have faith. And by the way, if that club is not in your bag, you can't even please me. Woo. Here's a question, Grace. Is faith in our bag? Is it in your bag? Well, Keith, I'm a Christian. Of course, I, I know, I know. Let's just, let's just talk today. Today. However long today has been for you. Have you lived by faith today? Like everything it says is real is real. And everything it says we should be after. Again, no guilt, no shame. We're all saved by a God who forgives all of us in our failures. That's not my heart. My heart to say he is so good and the mission is so awesome that we get the opportunity by faith to step into it. And so then what we start to see in the text after he teaches this is he starts to go and by faith, Abel, and he begins to talk about a sacrifice that he brought. And then he says, by faith, Noah, and Noah went and built the boat. And then he says, by faith, Abraham, and Abraham left. And then he says, by faith, Moses, Notice that this wasn't just like they believed in Jehovah God, but they lived like they believed in Jehovah God. And what he told them, they did. And then it comes to us, and we have to ask, are we living by faith? Again, not the generic faith of we have the Christian faith, but I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I do. How about you? Yay, yay, yay. No, no, no. Am I actually living it? out. I think that there have been times where we've been incredible at this as a church, but I think we face a point where we step right now and we say, what's next for us to do as a church? And I would say today's decisions impact tomorrow's stories. And so here's what I want to say to us, Grace, on base, where we are, not where we've been. But I want to look at us and say, let's be directed by big faith. Let's be directed by big faith. You know, some people say when they read the text that says Jesus willingly laid down his life. Never get it twisted. He didn't have it taken from him. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't like he wasn't strong enough. It wasn't like he got caught up in a political crew. Jesus willingly chose to lay down his life for you and for me. But here's what's just true, friends. It is easy to lay down your life the way Jesus did when you have lived the way Jesus did. Jesus woke up every day and said, Dad, what do you want me to do? Dad, my word, my fruit, my desire is your heart and your passion. If they have seen you, me, they have seen you. You and I are one. I'm going to do what you want me to do, Dad. And then Jesus says, if you know me, live as I did. Live as though this book and God's truths are real. Live as though you are a co-heir of Christ. Live as though you are more than a conqueror. But how about this? That we should live as though heaven and hell are real. And we should live as though our lives are not our own. And we, Grace Fellowship, should live as if our resources aren't ours. And we, Grace Fellowship, should live as if God loves our kids more than we do. And we, Grace Fellowship, should should live with eternity in mind, not the next three hours. 
And we, Grace Fellowship, should forgive as the Lord forgave. And we, Grace Fellowship, will be known by our love. In other words, we, Grace Fellowship, will be known if we are directed by big faith. Again, hear me, I'm, I'm not saying this because I don't think that we have never done this. But I'm saying, can we continue? Can we do it more? Will we live it out more in the future? Because today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. And so what I want to do for a few minutes is to think about some ways that I think we can live out big faith. Ways that we can recognize that as God has blessed us, we are to bless others. And that part of what it means to live by faith is to have God impact your life, but not just impact your life for you, but to impact your life for the good of others. I think if we're going to live by faith and believe what the scripture has said, there's a ton of tentacles. But if we want to pick up that club and we want to swing it, I think one of the ways that we can live by and be directed by big faith is rooted in this, the way we invite. The way we invite What I'm talking about here is the way we invite people to church. Remember, I had us pray, I had us say, let's be honest, let's look in our souls. Like, we who believe in Jesus Christ follow a man who didn't come to the world to condemn it, but to save it. And we believe he invites not just you to the table, but everyone to the table. And he, we've talked about this recently, and God sends us into the world to tell people about it. How can they know if no one tells them? And I know there's a lot of ways to tell people about Jesus. And you don't need me to tell people about Jesus. You have the ability to do that on your own. You are gifted. You are guided by the Spirit. You can do that. But one of the ways that we show the world that we believe God matters and we connect people to the hope of Jesus is we connect them to a local church. And we talk all the time about inviting, inviting, inviting. And some of you think, you just... More and more and more and another campus, listen to me. I've said this to you and I mean this. The more people that come to Grace Fellowship, the more difficult my personal life is. Facts. And the longer it takes for you to get out of the parking lot. Facts. But I don't know about you, but we have the message of hope. We have the message of life. We have the message of meaning and purpose and forgiveness. So we've asked you, eternal, external eyes, all year, pray for two people, every day at two. It's been so fun to have, be in meetings over the course of this year and people on our staff, their alarms go off and we pray as a group and alarms go off. It's been awesome. And I hope you continue to pray. And even just this week on the golf trip, one of the guys there, he told me, one of his two is his sister and his sister met Jesus. I love that. But I wonder, if we're honest, Grace, how many of us have been praying for two that God has put in front of us and we've never had the spine and the heart and the faith to grab the club of faith and say, would you just try my church? Just come on, man. You know I love you. You know I'm for you. You know I wouldn't do anything but what. Would you try my church? Some of us, when we go to make decisions, we are the uh, classic paralysis by analysis people. When's the perfect situation? When's the perfect moment? When can, it, when can I? And I don't know, and they don't, not, and, then, and you're like one of those ready, aim, 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 people. Look at me, y'all. At some point, you got to fire. You got to pull the trigger. You got to say, you know what? I am going to live by faith and take the chance and believe that people go to heaven and hell and people need Jesus. And I know in this place will love them and serve them and care for them. And it's not perfect. So I'm going to ask them, would you come to my church? So earlier this year, when we were talking about this, I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to call everyone out and say, I think we should just all do it on the same Sunday, the same weekend. That everyone should just go, yep, this is the weekend. You're like, what will happen if they all come? I don't know. Let's find out. (laughs) 
So here in a few weekends on November 7th and November 10th, we're going to have a very specific message called Let's Talk. Those of you doing the calendar in your mind recognize that's the week of the election. Something tells me our world will be in a tizzy. And so who better to help us think about that tizzy than the Lord Jesus himself? So here's, here's the challenge. Here's the dare. Invite your two to come on November 7th or November 10th. No more waiting, no more stalling, no more aiming, but to say between now and then, would you come to my church? Some of you, your heart is racing. You're breathing heavy. I don't like, he may see me come in alone. It stops, it's not a judgment zone. But, it, but I'm back to it. Are you going to live by faith? And in that moment, it's going to take you grabbing that out. And you're going to be standing there with them. Would you be willing to come to church with me? Can I just remind you the result is not your problem? It's your job to swing. Big faith. The time is now. I'm not going to wait. So on the way out today, there'll be people that give you a card like this. Just a card for you to be able to take and to be able to pass to your, one of your two or to both of your two and to say, yep, I just would love you to come and to keep praying about it. But basically what I'm saying is, guys, Let's act by faith and ask. I'm not the only one that goes to grace that can rationalize all the reasons over and over and over. I never pull the trigger. Let's well, stop. Let's just do it. I hope we have so many people who are like, we don't even know what to do. I will love the chaos. Praying for the chaos. What would it look like for today's decisions to become tomorrow's stories and today's decisions would be that I would invite with big faith. There's been times where we've been great at that as a church. And I've told you, one of the reasons we're focusing on it this year is I don't think we're so good at it anymore. Number two, I think another way that we can have big faith and pull that club is the way, oh, oh, the way we give. Some of you are like, I liked one. Uh, we believe that everything in the world is God's. And we believe that he is first and we believe that he is best. And we believe everything he has given to us is not only to be enjoyed, but also to be a blessing to other people. We believe that we are not owners of anything, that we are stewards of everything. We believe in a God who doesn't need anything. And we believe in a God who doesn't want to take from us, but actually in generosity wants to do something for us. We believe that materialism has a way of choking things out in our life that are not good. And we believe that one of the chief competitors for your heart and your affections and your desires is money and stuff. We believe that the love of money is the root of all evil. And we believe that money ultimately will not bring you happiness. Some of you are like, but I'd like to try We believe money is a tool to be used for the glory and goodness of God. Even in the last five or six days, I've had this conversation, but I've had it so many times where I talk with people, people that go to this church. Hey, what's a, what's a good investment? What's a, what's a profile or a stock or a portfolio thing I should be investing? What's going to give me ROI? What's going to give me that good return? How do, I, how do I invest a little and make a lot? What's, what's really, really good? What are the things I should spend on and give to that will be great? What are the things that I won't be wasting my money on? Listen to me. You will never regret investing in the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest return on your investment is to invest in a group of people whose desire is to give glory, God, and fame, and to move things forward. 
And I say this all the time whenever I start talking about money. If you don't trust me and you don't like this church, find a church you love with leaders you can trust and go give there. Stop making me or a big church your reason that you're not generous. Generosity is a gift that God wants to learn that we need to learn so that we can be more and more like our Savior. And one of the ways that happens is our ability to invest in what God values. And God refers to his church as his bride. God wants this thing to go forward. I'm not saying he always wants it to be like this. We've talked about We make choices to be who we are. But if this is your church, I love you. You should give here. You should You should invest here. You should be a part of it. You should bring your first and best to God and say, God, take it and multiply it through the nations. Not because we need another screen or we need another campus, but because people need Jesus and God wants to make you generous. And I've told you guys this before. My heart used to be awful at this. Save the grace of God through my wife who said, you're not going to live like this. You will not live as a godly man in our home and not figure out how to be generous and invest in church. And she said that long before this was my job. Guys, it's what we're called to do. Does the Bible say tithe? Is that gross? Is that net? Stop it. Stop it. Look and say we are investing and serving to try to reach people forever and ever for the glory of God. Now, there's there's brass tacks. Listen to me. We are at a place as a church that if we're going to go forward, one of our limitations will be money. Because we used to grow fast enough to be able just to get enough money from new givers to go forward. But the scale of size of where we are economically to be the kind of church that God's calling us to be won't happen if you're not generous. And today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. So some of us need to go to our bank account and by big faith, whoo, we'll set up that push pay thing. (laughs) Every month, Lord Jesus, amen. Guys, like I, our God doesn't need our money. Cattle on thousands of hills. He has it all. It's not about the bottom line. Grace right now, we're, we're actually several hundred thousand dollars behind where we should be with our giving right now. I don't lose an ounce of sleep over it. You know why? Because I know my God. He'll provide. It's not about that. It's about us being who God has called us to be. So here's the question. Do you Give financially as though you have big faith. Today's stories become, or today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. Let's live by big faith. Number three, number three. The way we worship. The way we worship. People who are Christians believe that God is not just real, but that he's worthy of praise and surrender and honor and reflection of what God has done for them. They believe he's worthy of praise just for who he is, and they believe that gathering together to encourage the brethren is good for the soul. They believe that coming together in community matters. Y'all have no idea how much practicing the power of presence matters to each other and to what God's doing here. Prioritizing being here. Keith, I can hear your message online. I got worship songs on Spotify. I'm fine. No, no, stop it. Do you know the parking lot sanctifies you? (laughs) The person who can't sing sanctifies you? That you hear a few seats over the the, the person that the situation with, I got to get my kids dressed sanctifies you? Listening to me yell at you sanctifies you? There's something that God does when we come together, when we prioritize it and say that that this matters and I'm going to be here. And then there's something about the way 
We sing. John Piper one time, he said, uh, missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship doesn't. What he was saying is that there's something that happens when God's people glorify him, not just with song, but with their lives that the world sees and the world is interested. The Bible talks about God's presence and habits, the praises of his people. It's funny, man, like it doesn't take much to give somebody something to find out a reaction. You know, different weekends at church, we give you all something when you leave. So we give you a pretzel, we give you ice cream, we give you a donut. And for the most part, you're all really happy with it. Thank you. That's great, that's kind, that's really cool that my church would do that. Some of you, you send us emails and say, I didn't give, so you buy the church pretzels. <laughs> I understand your heart, sir, ma'am, I get it, I understand. But, but just, can I, can I also remind you that the Bible says that one of the first things we're supposed to do is take care of each other and have some fun along the way. <laughs> that it's okay to encourage one another with a donut every once in a while. We'll get healthier, here's a celery stick in the future or whatever, you know? <laughs> But, but here, here, here's, here's what I'm saying. It's amazing, it's amazing to me how fast people can be emotional except sometimes when they're singing to God. I mean, some of you, it's like, oh, you're giving away T-shirts again. You know how much all them T-shirts cost? I'll fight somebody over those stupid T-shirts. You're passionate about it. Buckeye score, passionate about it. Your kid makes a good play, passionate, grades, passionate, grades anatomy, passionate. <laughs> but we go to various campuses and sing about the blood of Jesus and what God has done, and you sit there holding a cup of coffee like nothing has changed. Wow. Why do people lift their hands? It's not just because God called, it, called us to do it, but we lift our hands because lifting our hands is testifying that what is being sung is true. We lift our hands in surrender because we're like, God, I got no other options. We, we lift our hands in celebration of thank you. We lift our hands in reverence. And some of y'all, man, when's Keith going to start talking? I'll get, I'll get real personal. And some of you, as soon as I'm done and the last notes, out. Can't get my kids and get out of here fast enough. What? We are singing and praising and worshiping the creator of all. The God who is God, the one who is famous. So when we show up and we get ready to sing and we get ready to pray and we get ready to learn, we get the big faith club out. Let's go, God. And we swing. I, I got to ask, man, like, do you come to church expecting to encounter God? And today's decisions will become tomorrow's stories. What would it look like, Grace Fellowship, if we invited like that was true, if we gave like that was true, and we worshiped God like that was true? So when you come to church, can I suggest that first and foremost, you prioritize being here, but then you prepare your heart, you offer your body, you engage the Holy Spirit. You engage the Holy Spirit who is God inside of you if you're a Christian. Spirit, what do you wanna teach me? God, what do you wanna do in my life? And that instead of listening to me, instead of in coming to church, we would encounter God. And we would live by big faith. Now, here's a question, here's a question. This whole place called Grace Fellowship is made up of thousands of individuals. And so here's, here's the mirror that we all have to ask this weekend, all right? A couple questions. What would our tomorrow look like based on the faith you are demonstrating? Based on the faith I am demonstrating. What would our future, our tomorrow be based on what we individually are living like? So let me ask a couple questions personally related to the areas of big faith that I should say we should swing away in. All right, here, here's the first question. Uh, is big faith reflected in how you answer these questions? When is the last time you invited someone to church? Like you actually said, will you come to church with me? When is the last time you did that? Here's, here's another one. Uh, 
what words would you use to describe your financial giving at Grace Fellowship? Is it generous? Is it sacrificial? Is it zero? Is it religious? Is it joyful? What words would you use to describe your giving to Grace Fellowship? Question, last question. Do I consistently prepare my heart and mind to engage God in corporate worship? Some of you are like, dude, I got a five-year-old. I, I wanted to kill him in the Odyssey on the way here. <laughs> I get it. But what's it look like to stop and say, God, I know it's not a magic building, but this is your place for God's people to do something, whatever campus I'm at. And so, God, I need to prepare my heart and mind. So, God, guys, come on, what would it look like to do this? To like really, like really this week, ask ourselves, do we live by big faith and what is our life like and how does this play out? You know, in business and leadership, they say uh, you should start with the end in mind. What do you want this thing to be in your preferred future? You're raising kids. What do you want your adult kids to be like? I have a business. What do I want this business to be in 10 years? What do I want my health to be in 15 years? What do I, what do I, and you're supposed to start with the end in mind. So here's just a question. Like, what would we want 10 years from now at Grace to look like? <laughs> what would we want 20 years to look like? What do we want 50 years to look like? And I, I don't know much. But I know that whatever you would say, if it's for the glory of God and for the good of reaching people in the mission that one of the things it's gonna take is big faith. I might just name this club Big Faith for the future, y'all. <laughs> but it's gonna take, actually not this club. It don't hit real well. <laughs> but what if we actually said we're gonna do this with the way we invited, with the way we gave, with the way we worship God and gather together because we said this is what we want our preferred future to be. So we're gonna go backwards and we're gonna recognize that today's decisions become tomorrow's stories. And so today, today, I will live by big faith. And when tomorrow comes, I'll live by big faith. And when that next day comes, I will live by big faith. And if I put enough of those together and God breathes his Holy Spirit on it, something supernatural is gonna happen. You guys know this. This is far too important to play church. Let's make sure as a group of people, we understand the privilege and responsibility and opportunity we have as this local body to continue in our calling and to say, God, what is it you want us to do? Because you are so big and you are so good. And God, we will stand for that with you. Let's pray. Father, again, I just, I commend you for the faith of so many at our church, for the hearts of invitation, for the generous people that are just like crazy generous to what you're doing here, to the people who model what it looks like to have a heart poured out before you in a disposition that says, God, grow me and change me. And God, I pray that we would be an army of those kind of people that we would recognize right in front of us is an opportunity to live by big faith. So God, make us bold in invitation. Make lots of people who don't know you come November 7th and 10th. Not for our fame, but for yours. God, convict us of our greed and our materialism and break that so that we will be more generous and invest in your kingdom. And God, stir our hearts with greater affection for you through not just song, but prayer and fellowship and learning and discipleship that we would be your people together. And God, we pray all this for your fame and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite you to stand as we prepare to sing to a God who's even more than we can understand and we stand with that God.
There is no one so sure instead. My hope is held in your hand. When the castle is strong and my breath is weak, upon this rock I will stand.
Amen. Amen. It's so good. It's so good to sing to our God together. So good to be thoughtful and mindful of the type of faith we do or maybe don't have, but the type of church we can be, the type of church we are. And I want to maybe do something together for a moment that is similar to how we started the message from Keith, where he asked you to just put your hands out as a way of saying, I want to receive and I want to hear from God today. And if you are a believer and a part of this church, if you're a guest, like you don't have to do this, but if you're a part of this church, would you just join me in a prayer right now where you just lift your hand as a way of saying, God, I want to have big faith and I'm going to just pray for us and, and have us pray together that we'd be committed to this, All right? So let's pray this evening. God, with our hands raised right now, God, we pray and we ask that this just wouldn't be a message or a service that we are part of, but Lord, a chance for us to, to commit further to a faithful way of living. God, that's not just a generic belief in you, but like a way that we live that goes what you say is true. In the way we worship, in the way we give, in the way we gather, in the way we spend our time. God, in the way we invite. So Lord, for those with their hands raised right now, God, would this posture even be a way of saying, God, we want our faith to grow. God, we believe, but help our unbelief. So Lord, would we be a church of faith-filled people for your kingdom, for your name, for your glory, so that people would know you and be changed. Lord, grow our faith. We beg you, we ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. A few things before we dismiss this evening. If you need prayer for anything, come to the left of stage. We'd love to pray with you or for you. If you are new here, thanks so much for being here, this kind of family meeting today. Stop by Grace Central on the way out. You'll see a tent as you walk out. We'd love to meet you there this evening. And then on the way out, you will get an invite card. Feel free to take one or a handful of those uh, for your two or anybody else that you feel compelled to invite to that weekend. So grab those on the way out. And again, we'd love to see you back here next week as we start the series quotable about things in the Bible we wanna make sure we have stored in our heart, all right? So thanks for being here this evening. God bless. We'll see you back here next week.